Chapter 7. Is there anything in this universe more beautiful and protective than the simple complexity of a spider's web? Charlotte. I closed my eyes for concentration. This was more difficult than drawing energies from the force line directly into my body. I pointed a finger for focus at a spot some five yards distant from me. The idea of drawing energies from a distant location and controlling them would have seemed impossible to me until Oz pointed out to it was the same as the candle lighting exercise I had already mastered. Now it did not seem impossible, merely difficult. Confidently, I narrowed my concentration and in my mind's eye saw a gleaming blue light appear at the designated point. Without breaking my concentration, I moved my finger overhead in a slow arc. The light followed the lead, etching a glowing blue trail in the air behind, behind it. As it touched the ground again, or where I sensed the ground to be, I moved my finger again, moving the light into the second arc of the protective pentagram. It occurred to me that what I was doing was not unlike forming a normal, or the normal flat pentagram Gorkin had used at the hut. The only difference being that instead of being inscribed on the floor, this was etched overhead with its points dipping downward to touch the earth. It was more an umbrella than a border. The other major difference, I thought as I completed the task, was that I was doing it. Me, Skeev. What I had once watched with awe, I was now performing as routine. I touched the light down in its original place, completed the or completing the pentagram. Quietly pleased, I stood for a moment, eyes closed, studying the glowing blue lines etched in my mind's eye. Terrific, kid, came Oz's voice. Now, what say you damp it down a bit before we draw every peasant and demon hunter in the country? Surprised, I opened my eyes. The pentagram was still there, not imagined in my mind, but actually glowing overhead. Its cold blue light gave an eerie illumination to the scene that negated the warmth of our little campfire. Sorry, Oz. I quickly eased my control on the energy and watched as the lines of the pentagram faded to invisibility. They were still there. I could feel their presence in the night air above me. Now, however, however, they could not be seen with normal vision. More for the joy of it than in, out of any lack of confidence, I closed my eyes again and looked at them. They glowed there in shimmering beauty, a cooler, reassuring presence to counter the impatience of the red-gold glow of the force line spear pointing doggedly toward tomorrow's path. Sit down, kid, and finish your lizard bird. We were out of the forest proper now, but despite the presence of the nearby road, game was still plentiful and fell ready victim to my snares. Oz still refused to join me in the meals, insisting alcohol was the only thing in this dimension worth consuming, but I dined frequently and royally. You know, kid, he said, looking up from his endless sword sharpening, you're really coming along pretty well with your studies. What do you mean? I mumbled through a bone, hoping he would elaborate. You're a lot more confident with your magic. You'd better watch your controls, though. You had enough energy in that pentagram to fry anything that bumped against it. I guess I'm still a bit worried about the assassins. Relax, kid. It's been... It's been three days since we set him up in that ambush of Quigley's. Even if he didn't stop them, they'll never catch up with us now. Did I really summon up that much power? I urged, eager for praise. Unless you are actually engaged in magical battle, wards are used as a warning signal only. If you put too much energy into them, it can have two potentially bad side effects. First, you can draw unnecessary attention to yourself by jarring or burning an innocent bystander who blunders into it. Second, if it actually reaches a magical opponent, it probably won't stop him, just alert him that he has a potentially dangerous foe in the area. I thought it was a good thing if I could summon up lots of power. Look, kid, this isn't a game. You're tapping into some very powerful forces here. The idea is to strengthen your control, not see how much you can liberate. If you get too careless with experimenting, you could end up helpless when the actual crunch comes. Oh, I said, unconvinced. Really, kid, you've got to learn this. Let me try an example. Suppose for a minute you're a soldier assigned to guard a pass. Your superiors put you on the post and gave you a stack of 10 pound rocks. All you have to do is watch to see if anyone comes and if someone does, drop a rock on his head. Are you with me so far? I guess so. Fine, now it's a long, boring duty and you have lots of time to think. You're very proud of your muscles and decide it's a bit insulting that you were only given 10 pound rocks. 20 pound rocks would be more effective and you think you could handle them as easily as the 10 pound variety. Logical? I nodded vaguely, still not sure what he was driving at. Just to prove the point to yourself, you have to 20 pound rock and sure enough, you can handle it. Then it occurs to you, if you can handle a 20 pounder, you should be able to handle a 40 pounder or even a 50 pounder. So you try, then it happens. He was getting so worked up, I felt no need to respond. 
you drop it on your foot or you pull a muscle or you keel over from heat exhaustion or any one of a hundred other things, then where are you? He leveled an accusing finger at me. The enemy strolls through the pass you're supposed to be guarding and you can't even lift the original 10 pound rock to stop them. All because you indulged in needless testing of idiotic muscle power. I was impressed and gave the matter serious thought before replying. I see what you're saying, Oz, but there's one flaw in your example. The key word is needless. Now, in my case, it's not a matter of having a stack of 10-pound rocks that would do the, do the job. I have a handful of gravel. I'm trying to scrounge around for a rock big enough to do some damage. True enough, Oz retorted, but the fact remains, if you overextend yourself, you won't be able to use what you already have. Even gravel can be effective if used at the right time. Don't underrate what you've got or what you're doing. Right now, you're keeping the finder spear going, maintaining the wards, and keeping my disguise intact. That's a lot for someone of your abilities to be doing simultaneously. If something happened right now, which would you drop first? Um, too late. We're already dead. You won't have time to ponder energy problems. That's why you always have to hold some back to deal with immediate situations while you rally your energies from other activities. Now, do you see? I think so, Oz, I said haltingly. I'm a bit tired. Well, think about it. It's important. In the meantime, get some sleep and try to store up your energies. Incidentally, let the finder spear go for now. You can summon it up again in the morning. Right now, it's just a needless dream. Okay, Oz, how about your disguise? Hmm, better keep that. It'll be good practice for you to maintain both that, maintain both that and the wards in your sleep. Speaking of which, right, Oz? I drew my acquired assassin's cloak about me for warmth and curled up. Despite his gruff manner, Oz was insistent that I get enough sleep as well as food. Sleep did not come easily, however. I found I was still a bit wound up over casting the wards. Oz? Yeah, kid. How would you say my powers right now stack up against the devils? What devils? The assassins that were following us. I keep telling you, kid, those weren't devils. Those were imps. What's the difference? I told you before, imps are from Imper and devils are from Diva, I finished for him. But what does that mean? I mean, are their powers different or something? You'd better believe it, kid, Oz snorted. Devils are some of the meanest characters you'd ever not want to tangle with. They're some of the most feared and respected characters in the dimensions. Are they warriors, mercenaries? Oz shook his head. Worse, he answered. They're merchants. Merchants? Don't sneer, kid. Maybe merchants is too sedate a phrase to describe them. Traitor Supreme is more like it. Tell me more, Oz. Well, history was never my forte, but as near as I can tell, at one time, the entire dimension of Diva faced economic ruin. The lands suffered a plague that affected the elements. Fish could not live in the oceans. Plants could not grow in the soil. Those plants that did grow were twisted and changed and poisoned the animals. The dimension was no longer able to support the life of its citizenry. I lay staring up at the stars as Oz continued his tale. Dimension travel, once a frivolous pastime, now became the key to survival. Many left Diva, migrating singly or in groups to other dimensions. The tales of their bare and miserable homeland served as a prototype for many religious groups' concept of an afterworld for evil souls. The ones who stayed, however, decided to use the power of dimension travel in a different way. They established themselves as traders, traveling the dimensions, buying and selling wonders. What is common in one dimension is frequently rare in another. As the practice grew, they became rich and powerful, also the shrewdest hagglers in all the dimensions. Their techniques for driving a hard bargain have been passed down from generation to generation and, and polished until now they are without equal. They are scattered through the dimensions, returning to Diva only occasionally to visit the bazaar. The bazaar, I prompted. No one can travel extensively in all the dimensions in one lifetime. The bazaar on Diva is the place the devils meet to trade with each other. An off-dimension visitor there will be sore-pressed to not lose or much, much less hold his own. It's said if you make a deal with a devil, you'd be wise to count your fingers afterward, then your arms and legs, then your relatives. I get the picture. Now, how about the imps? The imps, Oz said the word as if it tasted bad. The imps are inferior to the devils in every way. How so? They're cheap imitations. Their dimension, Imper, lies close to Diva, and the Devils bargain with them so often that they're almost bankrupt from the irresistible fair deals. To hold their own, they've taken to aping the Devils, attempting to peddle wonders through the dimensions. To the uneducated, they may seem clever and powerful. In fact, occasionally, they try to pass themselves off as Devils. Compared to the Master, however, they're bungling incompetence. He trailed off into silence. I pondered his words, and they prompted another question. Say, Oz? Hmm? Yeah, kid? What dimension do you come from? Perv. Does that make you a pervert? 
No, that makes me a pervect. Now shut up. I assumed he wanted me to go to sleep and maintained sit in silence for several minutes. There was just one more question I had to ask, however, if I was going to get any sleep at all. Oz, keep it down, kid. What dimension is this? Hmm? This is Claw, kid. Now, for the last time, shut up. What does that make me, Oz? There was no answer. Oz? I rolled over to look at him. He was staring out into the darkness and listening intently. What is it? I think we've got company, kid. As if in response to his words, I felt a tremor in the wards as something came through. I bounded to my feet as two figures appeared at the edge of the firelight. The light was dimming, but was sufficient to reveal the fact that both figures were wearing the hooded cloaks of assassins, and the gold side was out. <laughs>